Hello and uh, welcome to Preforum Digital Music and uh, Sound Art. I'm Cedric Furman. Um, I was a member of the jury. Um, today we will talk with Alexander Schubert, um, Douglas McCausland, and Rashin Fahandesh, who is with us. <laughs> the two other ones are online today. Uh, we will speak about uh, their projects um, we selected this year. Um, we will start first with um, Alexander. Um, hello, Alexander. Um, the sound yeah. is muted, I think, or? Is it? Oh, uh, yeah, it was muted. <laughs> I'm sorry. Hello, I hope you are well. And, uh, well, I'm going straight to jump. <laughs> uh, could you briefly introduce us to your project? Just give us a few words. Yes, uh, I do that with pleasure. Uh, first of all, I'm sorry that I can't be, um, can't be around for such a um, um, great event. I honestly would love to be there. Um, so, um, yeah, my name is Alexander Schubert. I'm a, kind of, um, I guess, multimedia composer in which I combine electronic music and acoustic music with other media, ranging from installation works to video parts, working with sensors and everything. Um, the lights and kind of using music as a structure to bring together technology elements. And um, I have done the same thing um, in the piece Convergence, um, which was written for a string ensemble, the Ensemble Resonance, and was co-developed with um, AI researchers in which we created kind of mirror images, avatars, or um, let's say interpolated human beings um, based on the musicians in the ensemble. So we did audio recording, video recordings with the musicians and um, through the use of um, deep learning algorithms, we created kind of counterparts um, of them. And um, in the piece, the musicians interact with their kind of um, transformed, interpolated or um, yeah, warped identities, so to say. And um, Maybe before I go into, into the details or, or um, what motivated me to do that, maybe we can um, take a look at a short excerpt of the piece. Yes. Normally, we don't see the sliders. These values These adjustment bells. But they can move into our consciousness. Through psychotic states. computation processes like in this case thank you <laughs> all right so <clears throat> um, that was a short excerpt of, of a piece that actually comes by now in several iterations. That is kind of a, 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 an online video version of that piece only, and it has been staged in different formats. So um, I guess the, the fundamental approach I already explained in a way. So that is kind of the technology that is behind it, kind of um, sort of scanning or reading out um, humans, both the voices playing um, the instruments um, and uh, body postures and uh, then creating these, uh, these mirror images. And um, so um, the, the motivation behind that is to, uh, is to create entities that are parametric. So we already had that a bit uh, in that section. 
So um, the the idea is that um, these um, mainly the autoencoders that are you, that is the specific um, deep learning part that is um, also used within that piece is it takes something like a, let's say just a human and breaks it down into a set of parameters which are then changeable and editable. So the big idea here is to look at the world, look at a human as a set of parameters, as a model. So, and technology can do that. And we can, through that, maybe also look at the, at the implications and also maybe at the negative implications of what that means, this, what that means, this kind of deconstructing the human. So that's the one part. But the other part is also, um, it's, so for one, it's kind of a, maybe let's say a critique of some um, usages of um, of this technology, but on the one hand, on the other hand, it's also it mimics something that we in our brain, in our cognition, also do. We also have models of the world of other people, of entities, and um, the what the the model of the how we perceive the world is constructive. So the technology here is used to kind of make these models fluid. And um, this fluidity maybe has then again points into the two directions, one being, you could see it as liberating maybe, or as seeing that there's always a, um, there are different parts within you, or you know, you, you can, um, there's, you are not such a fixed personality as you might assume. And, um, but on the other hand, it also has, of course, this kind of frightening um, aspect in it. So <clears throat> maybe um, as a, a final statement, what interests me here is using technology for one to expose negative um, implications of them, but also use it as a tool to rethink how we how we um, how we perceive how we um, how, how we perceive the world, and it's this kind of jumping back and forth between different viewpoints and exposing. Um, this switching, um, it is what interests me. And this uh, maybe then creates this ambivalence of how we, how we feel about this. And um, I would like to finish with mentioning um, that a lot of people were involved in this project. Without them, I could not have realized it. And um, for the whole audio part and uh, start developing, it uh, was the, uh, the AI team at ILCOM which is uh, Philip Esling and Antoine Caillon specifically um, for this project. And the whole video um, development was done by Jorge Davia Hakon, and the ensemble that played was Ensemble Resonance, and it was co-supported uh, from the podium Esling. So sorry for the um, long stream of uh, thank yous, but um, without them, this piece would not have happened in the way it has. And um, I'd also like to take the opportunity to say how uh, meaningful this award is, it's um, really a um, kind of once in a lifetime goal to and honor to work towards. So um, I want to say thank you very much. <laughs> All right, thank you too. Um, I have a question, a pretty particular question maybe. Um, I and a few other people wondered, uh, what is the influence of the programmer uh, regarding the AI and this space, because an AI is never neutral, isn't it? Yeah. So this AI has been taught to recognize those faces and the voices and so on, but it, can you figure out what is the, the influence of the programmer into this project, if there is one? Mm. Um. It is, I mean, it's true that it's not neutral in a way. You kind of take these algorithms and then there's definitely also kind of a, a creative, a selective part, like which which path you go to down. Like, do you try to, op like, basically in a way, like in what direction you optimize. And um, I think we've been kind of explorative in a way that we wanted something that is not as perfect as possible, but that actually shows also the kind of weird side parts. So. Um, I guess that could be one um, one answer to it. So the kind of um, the the pursuit not for the for reconstructing the original as good as possible, but also for having something that um, outputs the the weird, the um, the obscure uh, in it. All right, thank you. Um, so I found 
part of the piece a bit creepy. I must say, I love the piece, but um, what was the exact intention you had when giving this kind of nightmarish vibe uh, into the music, but also the, the images, sometimes those uh, faces transforming and yeah. uh, melting? Mm. I mean, it's like this, uh, that this kind of the trippy part of it for sure is in there. And it's um, like also in the section that we just looked at, it's um, in a way it says you can have this melting down of your constructive models um, of how you see the world. That can happen if you have a fever dream. Well, if you're dreaming, if you take drugs or if you're under um, in a psychotic stress or something like this. Or as we do it here, we kind of use the, these computation processes to kind of also illustrate it in a way. And um, yeah, I mean, it, it has this nightmarish kind of part of it, but it doesn't only have that, at least for me not. So it also, I also see something fascinating in it maybe, and maybe that's also like exactly the point where we are, this kind of this ambivalence between being attracted to all these possibilities and um, also the, um, kind of being afraid of it a bit. but. Maybe so. In general, I, I definitely see also some, at least a positive aspect of it. This kind of this, what I meant with fluidity. So this kind of not that nothing is set in stone, and kind of accepting that also has kind of a, or hopefully maybe also a a, um, a liberating um, aspect to it. So, um, yeah, it's <laughs> this kind of. I don't see it just as something negative, even though it is, of course, kind of um, has a also <laughs> definitely has this kind of nightmarish vibe to it. But it's not just that. It's I mean the the kind of the the epilogue of the piece is also kind of um, a like there's a final speech kind of um, where it goes about the kind of drifting apart of the human or the kind of the the optimizing of it, and it's. You know, it's a, it's also a form of transcendence, if you want. So it's kind of the letting go uh, that is something that I'm intrigued by, and the, the the positive aspects and the negative aspects of this letting go, losing control. All right, and uh, um, this AI is uh, giving orders to to the musicians, in fact, yeah. <laughs> and. Uh, what is your view on this, that the, the, uh, an AI, a machine, would give orders to humans and the humans would uh, obey or, or not and react or not? In the end, there is this interaction, of course. I, I suppose they were not forced <laughs> to, to, yeah. to interact. But uh, what is uh, your, your comment on this? Um, it's actually an interest or a, a funny story, if you want, for this specific piece. So this working with kind of with voice commands is something that I have been increasingly doing over um, the past few uh, previous pieces. And here actually I first wanted, I needed to record the material of the musicians and I basically created these like instruction um, programs that could do that just so that we could gather the material. And while we were doing that, that was actually just the preparation phase of it. It was such a strange situation people sitting in a black room with a machine telling them, no, open your mouth, show your teeth, slightly turn to the left. If you do that for, for two or three hours, you're kind of, you are um, like, it's a bit like in this, um, I think it's an Indian, um, um, I, what's, what's the right word for it? Um, ancient belief maybe that if you take a, um, a photo, um, of a human that you take part of the soul of it. And within that thing, you felt so exposed in a way. It felt like it was kind of sucking out of you um, what you were. And I found that very fascinating. So um, actually, just because of that, I started to center the piece around these um, the verbal instructions of the machine, which um, so yeah, it's also it's it's actually again the same thing. The what the people felt doing this process ranged from like a weird form of control, not liking it, and also some had more this kind of again kind of letting go, kind of meditation like thing. So um, they they started to also to enjoy it. Kind of it's really weird if you give control if you allow it <laughs> over like every. Even about the emotions, so um, 
the, some of the musicians also told me that there were passages where you're supposed to just look angry or sad or so. And feedback that I got is that you rarely ever isolate things so precisely. Um, so it's, yeah, it has this weird, it's, it's again about letting go, about having control or um, losing control and about this. It also makes you, again, also makes you um, reconsider yourself. Like it's the, if you present this um, just one emotion, like um, also with the, with the muscle feedback and so on, you also start to feel this thing. If you, if you laugh enough, then a certain part of your brain will also make you happy. So, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, like what that in general means, where this leads us, like on a more, um, um, on a kind of state level, um, if machines get this form of, of power, of decision power, I mean, that's a, that's a very complex, um, <laughs> a very complex question. I'm not sure if I can answer that in this time frame. It is. Thank you a lot, Alexander. Uh, we are not going. My pleasure. We are now going to switch to uh, Douglas. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Um, uh. So your project um, involved also um, a sort of battle, maybe, <laughs> or interaction between a uh, human performing with a contrabass, extended contrabass with uh, microphones, and another humans helped with the machine <laughs> interacting. Uh, could you explain your project, please? Sure. Um, well, first off, uh, I'm so glad to be here. Uh, again, my name is Douglas McCausland, and I'm a composer, performer, and digital artist currently based out of the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, my project, Convergence, also serendip serendipitously titled Convergence, um, is exactly as you were just saying, uh, a sort of collaborative performance uh, that I created and designed for Alexander Caprice, the double bassist, and myself uh, serving as sort of the electronics performer. Um, and before I say anything more, I think it would be good perhaps to go on ahead and let uh, an excerpt of the piece sort of speak for itself and kind of ground um, the rest of my discussion and sort of introduction. So if we could go on ahead and play that excerpt, that'd be great. So this piece is really, in many ways, um, as the title would suggest, um, it's, a, it's a convergence of a lot of different ideas, or, or perhaps you could say a confluence of a lot of different ideas, which are both ideas that I'm engaging with in the piece and also through, um, throughout my artistic or creative practice. So there's, um, you know, sonically, there's, I get to engage with uh, my love of noise music and, and harsh juxtapositions of abrasive kind of textures and, uh, sudden formal jumps and shifts that occur in real time. But uh, there's, there's a lot more going on because as the bass itself is outfitted with eight contact microphones as well as um, a number of other kinds of uh, sensors and things which are feeding in to a computer system which is then mapping that out in many ways in regards to amplification of the sound itself, but also in regards to spatialization of the sound as well. So we sort of take the bass and um, explode it out into space. And so the actual performer on the bass, where their, their physical actions correspond not only to sounds, but also to sort of like discrete points in space. Um, and the performers are seated in the center uh, of a large ambisonic speaker array. It was originally designed for performance in a 56.8 uh, speaker dome here at the Center for Computer Research and Music and Acoustics. Uh, and the audience was seated around uh, us. So there's an interesting mapping which occurs between their perception of what the bassist is doing as well as where the sound is occurring in space around them. 
But that is further sort of manipulated or, or um, controlled perhaps by the electronics performer, which is uh, I'm performing with a pair of uh, custom designed performance interfaces, which I created here. I have one here, which I can hold up. You can see perhaps um, these are glove based interfaces, which are made generally speaking out of scavenged parts and sensors. Um, and then running through some, a pair of teensy microcontrollers that, you know, they include three axis controls for gesture capture and things like that. But that ultimately feeds then into machine learning algorithms, which allow me to classify gesture and utilize and sort of unlock gesture as a method of control uh, in this performance system. Um, so it engages, you know, technologically with, with spatial audio, with machine learning, with uh, interface design and real-time electronics performance and DSP control and sound synthesis. Um, but aesthetically, I think it's interesting that you use the word battle because um, it really is very much a dialogue, a back and forth between all of these different elements in real time. All of them are sort of vying for control or, or um, you know, taking control of the piece at various points, whether that's the bassist or the electronics performer or the performance system itself is sometimes uh, responding in real time as well to both of these, these inputs, so. Mm. And uh, so you are currently mixing this um, sort of static multi-channel installation together with uh, a real emotional live action at some point. And I find it interesting to see how um, stoic you look like when you perform with the gloves while uh, the contra uh, contrabassist um, is sweating and, and looks like somebody really, really tense. <laughs> and uh, uh, was it intentional uh, to have this um, display somehow, or did it come through the, the, the process? It, 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 did the process lead you to behave, both of you, in such a different manner? I think the, the, the process is definitely part of it here. Um, but another element is the, the sort of the, the simple answer in one way is that um, I'm serving both as a performer but also as sort of the conduit for, for control of the system. And so there's a number of points where you can see me like look off to the left, um, which is at a screen nearby because I may be monitoring something in the system in real time. So some of that is simply by merit of the fact that I'm sort of uh, divided, sort of as I'm thinking through the piece. That being said, um, when you're performing with such an emotive and powerful um, musician as Alexander is, um, he does bring out a, a real raw energy that I um, tapped into as much as possible. And I think that that sort of um, kind of contrast between us is something that is really interesting to me as I, as I go back and view the piece. Um, because in some ways it's conscious, but in some ways it's not. It's just uh, some of it comes down to what the difference is in, in who we are as performers. Uh, and how those various kinds of emotions and musical interactions sort of fed into this, this collaboration, this performance, and this experience. Um, yeah, it's, it was a real, real pleasure to work with him, and I want to <laughs> uh, extend a special thank you to Alexander as well. All right, and uh, are you seeing further development of this piece or other pieces in, in, in this vein uh, as do or, or, or more? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I'm currently working on, from the technical perspective, I'm working on a sort of new revision of both of the gloves that were utilized in that piece. Um, so that's including sort of a more uh, robust physical build that's sturdy and travels a little bit better, but also includes new sensors, new methods of control, um, as well as some new sort of apparatus for the interface itself, uh, which includes uh, sort of like a throat mic um, and transducer combination so I can actually pipe sound uh, into my own throat and then pick it back up. But 
Um, so that's, you know, to answer your question from like the technological perspective is that, yeah, this is a very much a living work or a continuing project that I will be working on for, uh, for some time. But musically, I'm already working on um, two potential sort of new spokes to this, this project, one of which is um, more of a solo performance, which is exploring, um, you know, this, this method of control in this particular performance system um, from a more solipsistic kind of perspective, but then I'm also now working on um, another piece uh, which will be hopefully finished by, um, by the end of the year with a larger ensemble. Um, and I'm really interested to see how both of those projects go and how you know, these different sorts of um, ideas and um, elements emerge through that practice of working through those pieces and those ideas. I, um, I think it'll be, I think they'll yield very different results and I'm really open to that and excited to, to see that and experience that um, for myself. <laughs> All right, thank you a lot, Douglas. And now we are going to switch to Russian and your project, um, Father's Lullaby. And, uh, well, compared to both uh, previous projects, there is a huge <laughs> difference, I would say. There is a, a, a straightforward uh, social, social, social political message in, in your project. Could, we, could you speak about this, please? Sure. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. It's great to be here and in, in these conversations. Um, so my name is Roshin Fahandej. I'm a multidisciplinary um, artist and filmmaker, and I also consider myself civic designer through art. <laughs> so this project, um, A Father's Lullaby, is about um, the absence of fathers due to the racial disparity in the criminal justice system in the United States, um, and how that absence manifests in the life of children and um, women and lower income communities of color particularly. Um, um, the project is a living organism and a multi-year project um, and sort of really thinking about the space of art and immersive storytelling um, and technology as a way of connecting us to these issues and really creating different perception and different connection and intimacy. Um, and for me, it's also about philosophy um, of, of a nation, of universe, of how we approach each other and how these um, spaces uh, of, of experience could transcend us to be able to uh, create new visions and perspective of, of each other. Uh, maybe, maybe we could watch uh, the, the two-minute experience. Um, the project exists as an artistic intervention at, at public site, as audio, um, also in Im immersive installation. And it has two arms. Um, I use the lullabies and memories of childhood um, and wherever the project goes, it's an open call to the community in that space. But at the same time, um, intimate work with, with formerly incarcerated fathers. Um, maybe I'll stop there and we could watch the two minute video that is a experience, a, a, three, a three, um, channel, uh, video and, and five channel, um, audio in ICN.
Brown skin girl, stay home and mind, baby. I'm going away on a sailing boat, and if I don't come back, stay home and mind, baby. I am. She's standing right in front of me, speaking words of wisdom. Let it be. Well, when the first guy said this, I was sentenced to 360 months, which is 30 years. My 28 year old son now, he was seven years old. Twins, they were 45 days old. Now, I'm just been released a few months ago. They're 21 now. Like something dissolves in water. Like something dissolves in water. Dissolves in water. Place where their lullabies like transcend. Dissolves in rattling bones and earthly silence. Thank you. Um, so you presented um, a project with a very strong feminist message, but working with men, which is somehow a bit unusual. Um, how did you start this process? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what made, yes. made you decide to, to work specifically, specifically with men. As mm -hmm. you say, uh, jails are mostly filled with men more than mm -hmm. women in the USA, so I guess it might be one of the reasons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so the, the genesis of the project is, um, I, I was looking at the issue of violence and inner city violence um, and the experience that the youth have in the United States. And I grew up in Iran, and um, um, for, for me, that perspective was very profound in a way, an uh, uncomprehendable way. That, um, and, and this is, I, I would say, the genesis goes back 17 years ago when I was teaching after school programs. And one of the issues that they was coming up for students to what issues they want to speak to about, they, it was rest in peace pins. So they were encountering so much loss and trauma, or they wanted to talk about police brutality and the stop and frisk um, issue. Um, but it took, you know, it was till 2015 that I was an artist in residence with mayor's office, that we were embedded in different departments looking uh, through this artistic lens at the way that the system was and the challenges that they had and using artistic creation as a way of intervention and criticality and re-envisioning that, that space and process. And it was till then that I started looking at the specific policies and, and, and the numbers and data um, and really creating correlation and connection between that a space of violence and trauma and the amount of absence and how that absence was sort of having this sort of tangible, strong impact, intergenerational impact uh, on children and on the next generation, but also on women uh, and how they were silenced. They, 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 most of the fathers that I talked to, they had single mom who had to work double job to survive, uh, trauma was part of their daily kind of encounters as, as a child. They got into the system as a child. Um, so for me, the project is about really envisioning a future society that we could build it based on care and love and, and support and really bringing a different lens um, and using this space as, as a way of uh, bringing at, you know, attention to it or call for action. So because the project, I call it art as ecosystem. So it's not one project that we do, but cr thinking about how there could be an eco ecosystem of interconnected efforts, interinstitutional, 
intersectional uh, and engage public space as well as virtual space and really create a poetic movement through the audio and visuals and, and interventions um, and really put, put it on the, on the public, on us, um, rather than those who are like directly impacted by it. Um, and I think the, the, the beauty of sound and the beauty of when you talk about lullaby, it's, it's a moment that you don't need to convince anybody to anything. Like as soon as you mention lullaby, we all go to very intimate, powerful space, but also it's vastly could be different experiences, right? So that multiplicity of experiences, the beauty of that, and then make that a collective history of how we look at ourselves in the mirror and how we envision our future. Um, and another element of it, you can always bring me back to the question again <laughs> because... <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> another element of this, uh, you know, when thinking about sound and also technology, that it really have the, the power to create transcendental moments, but also um, facilita facilitate connections and, and um, encounters that it might not be otherwise, right? So for example, when you come to this space, you don't know who's formerly incarcerated and who's, you know, I, and individuals you have from deputy chief of a probation office to um, a father who just being released. It's a vast uh, spectrum of experiences that come to this space participating and singing lullabies. And the moments that you could actually encounter the sound and the voice of fathers and you know they are coming from that experience is the moment that you as, an art, as a participant, as a witness, you intentionally engage and touch these panels and you hold on to your touch in order to hear their narrative and that's the intimate uh, space. Uh, also, like what you saw here, the volumetric filmmaking is another powerful tool for me because um, not just poetically represent where the fathers are, that even though they are back, they are living in this space of presence and absence, that gap of history and the life that it was not built with their children is never collapsible because like the memories are not there and it's a big effort for them to connect. So to, to, have, to see him in that space of fluidity that you never can fully capture who that person is, but also kind of referencing the colonial aspect of you know, ownership over the images of, of, of the other and really like disrupting that through audio, and through the visual representations. Um, and I also, another aspect of the audio is that it's a touch, right? It, like your, in, your encounter is a very tactile, like it's a vibration and it's a sculptural form of a space and how you move around and you become part of the, this experience, not sitting in a comfortable seat of this is somebody else's experience. There is like um, that, that sort of tension. Um, and I want to mention, you know, like, <laughs> I want to make sure that I do do the tank also, because this, this, um, this award of distinction in, in the music and sound was very profound to me, because there were so many people participated through their voice. Like, what you see is, like, not even 5% of the archive that I'm sort of collecting. And uh, it's really beautiful to sort of have their voices recognized, so many collaborators, so many musicians, and, 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 and definitely my collaborators in this piece are uh, the, uh, on, on the current piece, Christian uh, Gentry and Krista Dragomer are, are two sound artists that they're working from two different spaces of, uh, that is sort of collapsing in this, um, in this space. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you ask you a second question. <laughs> no, thank you, thank you. Uh, no, what, what we uh, noticed, and we were really happy to see that, is that uh, we see this evolution um, 
of sound art and electroacoustic music that is often becoming more uh, engaged, mm -hmm. socially speaking, politically speaking. And I often refer to um, Ilan Mimaroglu mm -hmm. in uh, Turkey, or, or from Turkey, who was one of the very few composers in the 1970s mm -hmm. uh, uh, who was uh, politically engaged, criticizing uh, the Vietnam War, for example, and racism and so on. But it took decades before really seeing more people into this field of electroacoustic and uh, sound art and so on to really um, have a presence, a strong presence mm. in, in the scene, if we can say a scene. Um, so we have to thank you for this. <laughs> it's pretty, pretty amazing. And uh, so um, w what did lead you to, to, to be so engaged? Is it all your, your journey from, uh, well, what happened in Iran and then the, 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 the move to the USA and uh, your own uh, issues with, with, with life led mm -hmm. you to care about people and uh, speak about this uh, injustice and, and find a way to, to share through multimedia. Absolutely, mm. yes. Um, I, I definitely think my life experiences is that what I carry into my, into my work for sure. And so I grew up as a Baha'i in Iran, which is a persecuted minority, very idealist ideas of life and word and the center of their sort of uh, philosophy and vision is like world peace and getting rid of all kind of prejudice um, in order to sort of achieve that, including race and gender and nationality. And, um, but, but, it, but it is systemically up to this stage uh, per persecuted. But despite that oppression, um, we had such a vibrant, beautiful uh, community that that sort of collective actions and, and, and uh, that collective wisdom and coming together for a positive change was incredibly um, inspiring, and I was seeing it in practice, right? We were ex exercising this in, in life. Um, so the moment that, and, and it is very much centered on, 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 on love, right? Like on care. Um, so when I moved to United States, it was with that sort of mission that like I'm making this move and I want to choose media and art as, as a language that it could speak beyond borders and it could engage and it could really like the urgency because like for, for me in life there is an urgency that we need to speak to these things. I have no choice because of the world that I'm looking at, right? Um, and I think it's on all of us. Like I feel like it's, it needs every single one of us to do things in our own path differently and be able to envision and create that n future infrastructure that is different from you know, the, failing, the, failing, the failings that is happening now, right? Uh, so, and, I, and absolutely I see a direct correlation. So the, this issue of uh, criminalization uh, as a systemic uh, s part of marginalizing and exploiting and creating a second class. And the, the main part of that is also we use family nuclear, where children are being like raised and born and, and, and receiving the love, you know, systematically again, like if you look, if you look at the uh, history, like uh, Indian Americans uh, during a slavery, you look at immigration, you look at now mass incarceration, that's something that we use as a way of like disrupting this sort of, uh, the loving, caring space that creates the next generation and humanity. Uh, and I see direct correlation again, like with my experience. So of, of course, yeah, I'll, I'll come to it from that point of view, and for me, it's a representation that exists across the world, right? And we could look at the same issue and think about how is it possible 
to create different connection that is not based on biases and not based on uh, this sort of creating these binaries and, and hierarchies. And, and, I, and I do think, again, like that it's about that philosophy that we have as individuals and as a nation, as, an, and as a you know, uh, whole world, to really like reconsider. Uh, what, what, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you a lot. We are reaching the end. We have reached the oh, end <laughs> already. But thank you all three and congratulations also for winning and presenting such great and diverse and innovative uh, projects. And I hope <laughs> we will see more of you in the future. <laughs> <laughs> Thank All right. You. This was incredible. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It was nice to be here. It's a pleasure. And thanks to all of our yeah, audience. Thank you, All right, all right. <laughs> <laughs>